A while back, I made a video called Wigfrid and the Moose. It explained how Wigfrid's battle songs buffed the Were-Moose so much that he's able to fully tank raid bosses. Over the summer, Woody got updated with a skill tree, which made the Were-Moose way stronger than he was before. So me and Mattis of Mats decided to test out the new and improved Moose-Frid combo in a public server. Here's a summary of how our game went. Mats and I spawned in on night of day one. I think whoever started the server probably died to darkness and just left. Doesn't matter, since it's already really early, and most of the resources around spawn were untouched. Almost immediately after we spawned in, we were joined by our first random pub teammate, a Wartox player named Kai. At the start of day 2, we all went our separate ways. The mosaic biome was less than 2 screens away from spawn, which allowed me to quickly find it and start acquiring the basic mineral resources I'd need to start a base and tame a beefalo. Since Wigfred can only eat meat, I killed a bunch of taw birds, which gave me enough meat to last for days. Sometime during day 2, we were joined by our fourth team member, Autist Matrix, who, like Mats, also decided to play Woody. I ended day 2 by going down a sinkhole and picking grass for a backpack and light bulbs for an eventual lantern. On day 3, I crafted a backpack, a beeflo bell, a razor, and a shovel. I also got the silky formal beard skin, from one of them gifts that you get for playing the game too long. Since we're trying to do the Wigfred and Wermoose synergy, I'll need to get the Heart Running Ballad Battle Song, which requires a life-giving amulet to craft. So I dig up all the graves in hopes of getting one. I didn't get a life-giving, but I do happen to get a red gem, and a bunch of trinkets. The red gem will allow me to craft a life-giving amulet once I get a Presti, and I can trade the trinkets to Pig King for gold, which I can use to craft more battle helms. So all in all, grave robbing was definitely worth it. I jumped through the mosaic wormhole and ended up in the Pig King bile, which is where we'd eventually build our base. On day 4, I scouted the area around Pig King. There was another wormhole near the one that led to Mosaic. This wormhole went to the Dragonfly Desert, which is one of the most important biomes to have access to. Mats made me a walking stick, which increases my speed by 15% whenever I equip it. With my increased speed, I scouted the area and found out Pig King was right next to Bee Queen, Triple Mac Tusk, and the Killer Bee Biome, all of which are great. With that information, we decided to set up our alchemy engine and a fire pit at Pig King. On the night of day 4, I was able to find and shave some beefalo. Nothing really happened for most of day 5. I continued to tame my beefalo by feeding it twigs and began working on collecting the ingredients for the Presti. I also stumbled upon Wartox and other Woody in the process of taking down a whole living forest, which was pretty funny. Sometime during the night, I finally saddled my beefalo buddy and crafted a lantern. After collecting the bunnies, I was finally able to craft the Presti on day 6. Now that we had tier 1 magic, I could turn the red gem that was sitting in my inventory into a life-giving amulet. Now that I had the life-giving amulet, I needed some papyrus and the feathered pencil to turn it into the heart-rending ballad battle song. I also got a beefalo for the sole purpose of assembling the suspicious marble, since trying to move those on foot would take forever. So pretty much all of day 7 was spent exploring the map in search of the pieces and the swamp. After an entire day of riding, I found neither. At night, Wartox decided to activate the terrarium to summon the Eye of Terror. Unfortunately for this boss, he spawned right in the middle of a base that was fully prepared to fight him. We had a mighty Wolfgang, Wermoose, Wartox, Wormwood, and the Beefalo fighting him all at the same time, so the fight was over in less than 30 seconds. Our base was really close to Bee Queen, so on day 8, the crew that just killed the Eye of Terror migrated over to the gigantic beehive and immediately started the fight. Mattis of Mats didn't want to miss out on the action, so after I told him what was happening, he goosed all the way over here from Lunar Island and joined in to help as the Wermoose. In my opinion, Bee Queen is one of the toughest raid bosses in the game, if you fight her solo. What happened here was the exact opposite of a solo fight. We had 6 players using characters that are really strong at fighting her. The Wormoose has high damage resistance and can kill her rumble bees really quickly with his AoE smash attack. Wolfgang is the overall strongest character for boss rushing since he gets 2 times damage from day 1. Wendy has Abigail whose rapid AoE attacks are also good at killing rumble bees. Although not as strong as Wolfgang, Wigfrid is overall just a solid pick for combat since her extra 25% damage gives her higher DPS and her 25% damage resistance makes her more of a tank compared to most characters. The thing that made our crew completely broken is the presence of Wartox, who gets a soul every time a Grumble Bee dies. So we basically didn't need healing at all in the fight. Because our team was so stacked, the Bee Queen amounted to just holding down the attack button for less than a minute. After Bee Queen was dead, Mats gave me Papyrus which finally let me craft Heartrending Ballad. After obtaining the song, we immediately headed over to Dragonfly. Since it was just the two of us, it took us much longer to drain Dragonfly of its 27,500 HP. The cool thing about fighting DF with Wigfred and the Moose is that Heartrending Ballad makes Woody pretty much invincible to a regular form. Dragonfly hits for 75 damage, the Wermoose has 90% natural armor, therefore she's only doing 7.5 damage to him. Heartrending Ballad heals your team for 1 HP every time they land a hit, and the Moose is getting 7 hits in between Dragonfly slaps. Couple that with the Moose's HP regeneration, and he's effectively invincible against her, unless she enrages. Enrage isn't a problem though, since Wigford can just put her to sleep with a pan flute and she's back to normal. 
As mentioned before, the fight did take much longer than Bee Queen, so it ended up being carried over into Day 9, but after around 4 minutes of eating Dragonfly slaps to the face, the fight ended with Dragonfly dead and the moose at basically full HP. Unlike Day 8 and 9, which were full of excitement, Days 10 to 13 were pretty boring. The vast majority of my time was spent riding a beefalo all over the map in search of suspicious marble. From Day 9 to 10, I searched the Oasis Desert, Killer Bee Biome, Spider Quarry, and the rest of Dragonfly Desert. On day 11, I brought the Night Head from Dragonfly Desert to the set piece in the Triple Mac biome. Matt also gave me some reeds and a Moon Moth from Lunar Island which allowed me to make the Clear Minded Cadenza battle song. After searching the map for two more days, I finally found the Rook Nose at the end of the Mandrake Forest. Since I found the Bishop Head at the very beginning of the run, I had both pieces delivered to the set piece before the end of day 13. With all three chess piece statues assembled, I was done with the most annoying part of the run. Now it was time for the fun part. After heading back to base and gathering materials and decent food reserves, Matt and I headed down to the caves on day 14. Usually we'd go to the ruins after assembling the chess pieces, however since one of the other guys on the server already went to the ruins, we assumed that he pulled off the ruins rush so we wouldn't have to. So we decided to change it up a bit and test the duel out on Toadstool. Finding Toadstool was hardly an issue for us, since I kept the beeflow I used to assemble the pieces, I'm traveling significantly faster than a regular character using both a walking cane and a magi at the same time. Matt was also exploring the caves using the Were-Goose form, which is not only faster than my beeflow, but it also has the added benefit of night vision. Because of this, we were able to find Toadstool before the end of day 14. We were joined by Wolfgang Zav, who also wanted to get in on the action. So after helping Matt deal with nightmares and supplying our team with both armor and weaponry, we chopped Toadstool's cap to start the fight. Since I had both Heart Running Ballad and Clear Mighty Cadenza battle songs, it's really hard to die as the Weremoose when fighting Toad. When he doesn't have any spore caps, Toad's Boom Shrooms do 100 damage each. With the Weremoose's 90% natural armor, he's only taking 10 damage per bomb. This 10 damage is quickly healed up since Heart Running Ballad heals him 1 HP per hit and Toadstool doesn't attack very quickly. Because of this, Matt is almost invincible in this fight. I say almost because usually when we fight Toadstool with Wigmoose, we lure Toadstool behind a pawn and fight it there. By doing this, we get an extra 15 seconds to attack Toadstool before he begins to spawn another round of spore caps. Since we have Wolfgang Zav over here, hitting for 2 times damage, we didn't think it was necessary to lure. We got through phase 1 and phase 2 pretty smoothly, however in phase 3, things took a turn for the worse, when Zab got some pretty bad luck with the double stomps and ended up getting killed. Since our main damage dealer was down, we switched tactics and decided to lure Tozlo behind the pond. With a bit of help from Ghost Zav, I was able to acquire his glass axe, which let me do the chopping while Mats did the killing. We ended up killing Tozlo at the end of day 15, and thanks to Wig's songs, we came out of the fight with full sanity and full HP. After slaying the Toad, Mats and I took a quick trip to the Spalagmite biome to get glands for a Telltale Heart. After using the Heart to revive Zav, I joined Mats in destroying Spalagmites for Fossil Fragments. We'll need at least 8 Fossil Fragments if we want to fight the Ancient Fuel Weaver, which is basically one of the two final bosses in the game. And that's pretty much all we did during Day 16. On Day 17, we decided to fight the Nightmare Were Pig. Since Mats had the Were Beaver 3 perk, we didn't need to go to the ruins to get a pickaxe. In DST, most of the bosses get easier when there are more players fighting it. I don't think the Nightmare Were Pig is one of them. The pig will only go into his huffing state if he misses 3 body slams in a row. More players not only means more potential targets, but sometimes this dude decides to switch targets for no reason. Because of that, it's a dog crap fight. Both me and Zav got randomly hit a bunch of times in the fight, mostly when we were trying to get the pig to destroy the pillars. If I were to do it again, I'd probably just let Matt solo it as the moose. It's not like he needed help anyways. After Nightmare Were Pig, we finally got back to the surface at the end of day 18. When we got back to base, I scratched my head in confusion as I realized whoever built the base decided to put the kitchen and farm several screens away from the main base. Questionable structure placement aside, I really like how they made circles with the stone fruit, grass tufts, and saplings. Since there weren't really any bosses for us to fight until the shadow pieces on day 21, we basically just got extra supplies for winter and created three mush lights with the shroom skin that we got from Toadstool. Mats amazed the whole server with his ability to consistently place mush lights off center, which severely hurt the OCD part of my brain. However, from a pure functional standpoint, we placed lights so that our entire kitchen, bird cage, alchemy engine, and our crop circle was lit up. So all in all, I was pretty pleased. On day 21, the only notable thing that I did was fight the chess pieces. Since it was located so close to base and everyone saw me assembling the pieces, we had like half the server helping with the fight. Since we had so many people helping out, I just fought on the beef flow and buffed everyone with my battle songs. We had two Weremooses being buffed by Heart Running in this fight, so the pieces stood absolutely no chance. On day 22, I tried my luck at a walking game, since I would need to turn it into a lazy explorer for the Fuel Weaver fight. Unfortunately, no luck. Matt's decided he needed to take a break from the game and AFK is next to one of the Mushlights, not realizing that he'll eventually freeze to death since it's winter. 
so I spent a good chunk of the day trying to push him into the scaled furnace, only for him to join back when I was almost done. We realized that although someone built a shadow manipulator, we don't have enough purple gems to make a nightmare amulet, which is another item we'll need for the few weaver fight. So Matt, Zav, and I went to the Dragonfly Desert in hopes of getting some blue gems from the Ice Hounds. On day 23, we kept trying to get blue gems and kept failing. After we got tired of failing, I ended up getting one from a single Mactus camp in the middle of the Moonstone Forest. I combined the blue gem with one of my red gems to make a purple, and used that purple along with the one Zav gave me to make a nightmare amulet. On day 24, Mats and I set out to kill Klaus, an endeavor that turned out to be a complete waste of time. Finding his loot stash wasn't too difficult, however we simply could not find the no eye deer. So after a day and a half of running around both the mosaic and picking biome, we assumed that the deer just weren't there and headed back to base. Plus, Klaus is the easiest raid boss, so it's not the end of the world if we go through a game without 2v1ing him. You know what could be the end of the world? Fighting the twins at base with a bunch of people who aren't prepared. That's basically what happened to us on the night of day 25. Since I had the pan flute, I put them both to sleep after they spawned in, but that didn't stop our team from getting wrecked. The fight started off okay, however for some reason, the other Wigfrid decided it would be a good idea to fight Spasmatism without armor and without weapons. After running away to get an axe, she ate another charge to the face and died. Shortly after, Wormwood pulled off the coolest boss kill I've ever seen by killing Spasmatism mid-charge with his Bramble Husk Splash damage. This victory was unfortunately short-lived since Retinazer took down Wormwood with a volley of charges soon after. Wolfgang was the third victim on Retinazer's kill list. However, he got the twin's health low enough that, with the help of the Pan Flute, Matt and I were able to finish it off before it ran away. After reviving our fallen comrades, Matt's Wolfgang Zav and I spent day 26 preparing for the long and annoying journey of going to the ruins during winter. After preparing a bunch of food, we headed to the caves at the start of day 27. Exploring the ruins for the first time during winter is not a great idea, simply because unless you pack a lot of wood and grass, you're going to take a lot of freezing damage. So like the dummies we are, we decided to not prepare any wood or grass and just deal with it. Ways in which we dealt with it would range from burning random loot on the ground, burning valuable non-renewable resources, getting lucky by finding fire pits that other people have made, or just straight up eating the freeze damage. On day 28, Wolfgang Zab decided that touching grass was more important than playing this game. So it was just me and Mads from here on out. After warming ourselves by burning the remains of our fallen enemies, we headed from the wilds into the ruins. There we stumbled upon the fire pit that I mentioned earlier and after warming our thermal stones, we pressed onwards. At the completed station, I made a Thulocyte medallion which allowed me to pinpoint the location of the ancient key, which turned out to be in a different branch. Despite someone else clearly doing a runes rush early in the game, it turns out that the ancient guardian was still alive. We made sure to fix that real quick. This dude is by far the easiest boss we fought in this run. Majority of the fight was me just fighting nightmare creatures while Mads dealt with the actual boss. I was also freezing to death, but I decided to just tank it with the heals I was getting from heart running. At the end of day 29, this dude met his demise and coughed up a large ornate chest. We looted the chest for the ancient key, yellow gems, and lazy explorer. With the yellow gems, I made a star color staff at the nearest pseudoscience station, which put an end to our ongoing battle with freezing. At this point, we had everything we needed to summon Fuel Weaver. After finding the atrium bridge, Mats built the gate and we were ready to go walking. Before we went to the atrium, I tried to recruit a wild woody, but it seemed like he was on an important mission of his own. I also forgot to mention that Deerclops wreaked havoc on our surface base while we were in the ruins. Just thought I'd mention it because it was fun to piece together what happened with all the messages we were getting in chat. Sometime during day 31, Mats and I cheated our way into the void and teleported into the Fuel Weaver arena. You really don't want to fight Fuel Weaver while insane, because not only can he mind control you, but you don't want to have nightmare creatures hassling you throughout the fight. Because of this, I made a powerful sanity station by making two dwarf stars right next to each other. Each star provides 25 sanity per minute, so standing right in the middle of both will give you almost 1 sanity per second. While Matt's got his sanity up, I built the correct version of Fuel Weaver with the 8 fossil pieces. After Matt's sanity was full, I stood under the stars to max out my own. With full sanity, a bunch of armor, the nightmare amulet, a hambat, the lazy explorer, and both of my battle songs, I was ready to start the fight. Woody has a way higher sanity capacity than Wigfrid. Because of this, Woody is the one who puts in the Shadow Atrium, since putting it in decreases your sanity by 45 right off the bat. The fight went pretty smoothly in the beginning. With his high defenses and my heart-rending ballad battle song, the Wormus was able to tank phase 1 with a lot of HP remaining. Fearmatic Cadenza basically offset Fuel Weaver's huge insanity aura, which meant the Wormus was never in real danger of going insane. The problem is that phase 2 lasts a lot longer than phase 1, and Fuel Weaver hits so hard and so fast that heart-rending can't completely outheal the damage. Usually by the time you're fighting Fuel Weaver, you've already beaten Bee Queen, so combining Heart Rending with Jelly Beans is enough to 100% tank Fuel Weaver. However, Matt's never got any of the Jelly Beans from the Bee Queen fight, so his HP steadily went down as the fight progressed. At one point, his HP got so low that I had to stop what I was doing and bait Fuel Weaver away from him. 
Other than the HP issue that is solved by Jelly Beans, Boosfrid is a great matchup against Fuel Weaver. Wigfrid teleports around the arena and destroys the Unseen Hands. The Wermoose tanks Fuel Weaver in a corner. When Fuel Weaver is vulnerable, you don't have to worry about him healing, since the Wermoose's ground smash attack takes care of all of them, as long as you get them somewhat funneled, like how we got them. With Heartrending Ballad, the Wermoose isn't just gaining 1 HP per hit, he's sometimes gaining 3, 4, or even more HP per hit. Since he's getting 1 HP for each enemy he's hitting, and his ground smash hits Fuel Weaver and multiple Woven Shadows at the same time. Anyways, after the brief moment of panic, we were able to beat Fuel Weaver at the end of day 32 without using any sanity or healing items except for my two battle songs. At this point, we were ready to call it quits. I mean, we pretty much beat all the major bosses except for Crab King and Celestial Champion. However, our adventure didn't end there. We ended up doing some pretty cool stuff, and we had a pretty interesting boss fight at the end. If there's enough demand for the rest of the run, maybe I'll cover it in a part 2. That's basically how our test run of the new Wigfrid and Wermoose combo went. It's like how it was before, but just way better. Just remember to bring Jelly Beans for the Fuel Weaver fight so you can full on tank it, or else you may end up stressing out like we did. For those of you who made it all the way to the end of the video, thank you so much for watching, take care and have a great day.